Okay. Right. So we will continue our discussion on chapter four. This is chapter four, which is about model selection. But as I said before, this chapter is really about prelude to the design of machine learning algorithms because when we try to derive idealized machine learning algorithms that want to analyze the performance of these algorithms based on what we learned so far. And then we looked at the, so here's a quick review. So we looked at some simple algorithm called empirical risk minimization, which is called ERM. And then we analyze the, its performance of the algorithm. Okay, so that's written as an ERM. And these algorithms works on a given set of a given sample, which is S. And the, the kind of guarantee we get is of the form, which say, what's with high probability, the risk or generalization error of what algorithm returns is going to be bounded by something best we can do with this hypothesis in some sense. Okay. So that's the kind of form that, that we obtained with high probability. So, and then I said, this is related to so-called approximation and no, estimation error. Estimation. Which is say how, how easy it is to find uh, the best hypothesis in a hypothesis set. And there's some other notion called approximation error, which means that Uh, what's the, I mean, the, how, how, which it really measures the quality of a hypothesis set, which say the, what the best hypothesis in the hypothesis set, how good it is. So if we can find the best, I mean, if we can find the best hypothesis in a hypothesis set, how good that best hypothesis is compared to the really best one, which is called a Bayes hypothesis. Okay. So, but this is related to the, Estimation error, and I said, I mean, this ERM doesn't really perform well. That's because, in a sense, ERM work I mean, assumes very few structures on the hypothesis. So we looked at, although we didn't really analyze, we looked at something called structural risk minimization, which imposed a, a different hypothesis. I mean, some structure on the hypothesis set. So instead of saying, so this is called structural risk minimization. And then the idea is that instead of saying our hypothesis set H is just a monolithic set without any structure, in the structural risk hypothesis, I mean, up minimization, we say this hypothesis set actually, I mean, can be understood, I mean, it kind of stratified. So it's, it's going to be a union of some small hypothesis set where HK becomes more expressive if we increase K. And then the idea is to, instead of just finding a one hypothesis that works the best in the in a big hypothesis set H with respect to a given sample, it tried to find, a, I mean, do the two things at the same time. It tried to find a good HK in terms of generalized, I mean, in terms of having a small approximation, you know, estimation error. So it, it, it's, at the same time, you want to find HK, which have a small approximation error. So instead of just finding a one hypothesis in H, in a sense, we are finding a model, which is a hypothesis at HK, 
and a hypothesis in the model at the same time. And the real algorithm is defined like this. So if we are given sample, which is, okay, which is a sequence of labeled examples, x1, y1, to xm, ym. The algorithm, they find first, uh, is defined H SRM. So you solve the following optimization problem. So I think maybe a better way to write it is like this. So you find an, something that optimize, but the domain of the optimization, well, I mean the, the domain of the optimization where we find something is hypothesis set K. And also hypothesis in the hypothesis set. Okay. But then what's going to be the measure of success of the optimization objective? It's written like this, H, F of K and H, where F of K, H, is, has a usual component, which is the empirical risk. So it should perform well with respect to the given sample S, but it has some extra components. So one component is a Radamaka complexity of the hypothesis set, plus the last component is something related to index K. Okay. Then, so if you just compare this algorithm with the one from the, oh, okay, actually, let me write the final step. Final step is return H, sorry. So compared to the empirical risk minimization, the key difference is that it has some, when you do the optimization, it has some extra terms, like these two guys. It, it, what it really does is that it uh, measure the complexity, but it penalize hypothesis set, which is complex. So if K is large, that means our hypothesis set is more complex, that get penalized. And also Radamaka complexity is high when our hypothesis set is very rich and expressive. So such a rich and large hypothesis can also get penalized. And why we penalize them? I mean, because in such a big hypothesis set, the, we have a really, I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's going to be difficult to find uh, the best hypothesis in the hypothesis set, okay? So in a sense, estimation error will become large. So we, we penalize such a thing. And so the first component here, that's related to having small approximation error. And the other two components, they are related to the small estimation error. So the, this optimization objective that's given here, it balances the, these two things at the same time. It allows us to use rich hypothesis set because we want to minimize the first component, but at the same time, it prevents us from using two, I mean, two rich hypothesis set, I mean, because of the second term, because if we, our hypothesis set becomes too complicated, I mean, we will have a high, we will pay high price in, in terms of estimation. Right. And, so, so what we're gonna do today is, so I showed, okay, so let me just continue the review. I said, so if we do so, I mean, first before starting, this is an idealized algorithm that's because, uh, I mean, this term, Radamaka complexity, sometimes, I mean, most of the time, it's not possible to compute. Yeah, because I mean, this Radamaka complexity requires us to know about the distributions on the 
I mean, an input output pairs, and we don't know the distribution. And that's the whole reasons why we are doing this learning. So it's not really computable, but this becomes served as a, big, a good basis for designing the real implementable I mean, think designing some algorithm that we can actually use in practice. Okay. Right. And then what is, I mean, what can we gain by doing this algorithm? Uh, so, so, I mean, intuitively what this algorithm does is that it search for a good model and then search for a hypothesis at the same time using this new optimization objective. And if we do so, then we can, act, I mean, in practice, the algorithm designed from based on this structural risk minimization performs better than empirical risk minimization because it exploits more structure. And also we cannot see the better behavior of this structural risk minimization in the general, I mean, in some theoretical I mean, uh, generalization bound on the performance of this algorithm. So if you prove the theoretical bounds that have this form, so the probability over the sample that the result of the risk of structural risk minimization. So structural risk minimization is going to be, I mean, with bounded by something with a high probability, just like the one that I showed you above, like this one. But it will have a, the following form. It will be an infimum of H. But then the, well, the first component is what you expect, something that minimizes the risk. So H is an entire set, okay, not just HK, but entire set H plus, but this bound will have some extra term. The extra term is times the marker complexity of H. Each. So this means the I mean hypothesis set K H K, the index of hypothesis H K that contains H, and it's a minim the minimum such. So that's what we mean by this H sub K. Need more space. Need more space here. Let's make it a little bit larger. And there is some extra term that involve in K, which is rho K M plus something extra involving delta K okay? and minus delta. Now compared to this, the bound that we get for the empirical risk minimization, if we can apply the empirical risk minimization over this entire set H directly, I mean, this is set H directly. If we do so, then we get, uh, let me get the spotlight. So, okay. So it apply directly, then if we do so, then the bound that we get above is a bit different. Here, something similar, R of H. Let's raise this. So R of H part is the same, but instead of Radamaka complexity over the, the I mean, some specific hypothesis set, we have a Radamaka complexity for the entire thing. And then plus something extra that involve Delta, that will be high with, with high probability. So if you compare these two things, then in one case, we have okay, so let me sorry about this. I tried to use something from this zoom, but it doesn't really work well. So in this case, we have a Radamaka complex over entire H, 
and we are using rather marker complex for, uh, I mean, the hypothesis that H sub K of H, which is whose rather marker complexity will be much smaller than the rather marker complexity of the entire thing. So in this theoretical result, you can kind of see the benefit of using structural risk minimization. So if you search for model and hypothesis at the same time, we can get a, we can, I mean, even theoretically, we can show there is just some benefit. Of course, there is some extra penalty term here, but as you will see, this penalty term is not going to be very large because of it. I mean, the k is, is incorporated there as a log k. Okay. So we were going to show this bound, I mean, today. Let's, then we will look at a bit more. So this one, and then also, if time permits, we will also look at something called cross validation. That's our plan today. So, so we look at this analysis. And a new algorithm called cross validation, which is a lot closer to the actually implementable algorithm. So that's what we're going to do and then analyze. So, but in that, in, in doing so, there is something that I want you to know. I mean, okay, maybe just yeah, tell you about this in the next slides. So there are a few things, I mean, something that you, we already covered, but maybe I didn't really explain it this way. So having this perspective will be very useful when we follow the analysis. Um, reminder. Another marker complexity bound. What it performs. So before showing you the real analysis, let me give you some, uh, I mean, the re-expression of the Radamaka complexity bound in a multiple form so that, and something also we didn't, I didn't really prove, but something that also true. So that, I mean, you can see uh, whenever the need of using this bound arises, you can see what's really going on. Okay, but as a basic form of Radamaka complexity bound, the Radamaka complex bound was given like this for prob high probability of a sample. For some given hypothesis set H, the risk of H. So hypothesis I mean, is at the moment we are thinking about hypothesis which maps everything to all the inputs to either minus one and plus one, and risk is measured by how often we did this hypothesis get answered wrong. Okay, so the usual thing that we talked about, and it's a empirical risk plus other marker complexity of H plus square root of 2m, 1 over delta. So that's the original form. Uh, we're going to use a different form. And uh, so this one is equivalent. I mean, the off, in the proof, I mean, if you remember the proof, that really we use the form. I mean, this is some talk about when something good happens. So we are expecting the, for every H, it's a uh, risk is bounded above by empirical risk, which we can measure, okay? So this is a something good happens. What other something bad happens? Something bad happens when the risk is larger. So the, the risk that we compute, the, the, the we care about is larger than our estimation with, 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 uh, with this is some extra stuff. So in the proof, we, we, what we really showed was the following. So, which is equivalent statement from 
to, to the one above. The probability of some bad hypothesis is there in terms of our estimation, which means that R of H is larger than our bounds is low. I mean, it is low. That, that's something that we proved. One of the delta. Okay. So it's an equivalent statement to the one above, but we will do this switching many, many times without talking, I mean, telling you uh, about this switch. Okay. Showing the number one is same as showing number two. I mean, essentially, it's, it's just a taking the negation and they're taking the probability of the complements. Okay. And intuitively, the one above say every, everything is good, the one probability of everything is good. The one below say probability of something is bad. Okay. Now, the other equivalent form that we're going to use, I mean, equivalent in the sense that the one implies the other by different parameterization, is the following. So here we focus on the having delta. So we are fixing delta here. And then we rephrase our bound in terms of delta, the same, the fixed delta, we rephrase bound in terms of delta. But we might do something different, okay? But that is something different. We might sometimes want to say, we want to fix this I mean, extra, the bound by just epsilon. And we want to compute appropriate quantity on the, on the delta side. Okay. Here is an epsilon appropriate quantity on the delta side. So something that involves epsilon. So the exactly the same statement can be phrased in terms of epsilon in this way. So then what epsilon is going to be? And so epsilon is going to be the following form. So for H and everything is the same except the, the, some, the term involving delta, we just put epsilon, that's going to be bound one minus exponentiations minus two M epsilon square. So if you just plug in epsilon and say epsilon is equal to the I mean, the term here, and then solve these things in terms of, I mean, delta in terms of epsilon, that's exactly what you're gonna get, right? And the uh, one below will be the same. H. plus epsilon is going to be bounded above by epsilon square. So, I mean, this minus 2m epsilon square is the sum term that will appear often in our calculation. Yeah. And substance that's closely related to this term, which is a square root of, I mean, row one over delta divided by 2m. And this one will appear, and then these are the two forms which will use, I mean, interchangeably. And there's a last thing that I want to mention. So what are the intuitive what's really going on? What's going on is that this is the quantity that we ultimately care about is this guy. And we put an upper bound about this. But we may as well think about putting a lower bound. Okay, so instead of saying, because then what we really care about is the range of this unknown quantity in terms of the quantity that we care about, I mean, that we can measure, which is the empirical risk, okay? So right now we said the R over H is bounded above by R, the empirical risk plus some extra term is bound by this probability. But then we may as well say, R over H, probability that R of the four H, R of H is bounded below by what we can measure. 
yeah, plus minus some this extra term is going to be the some with have happened with some high probability. It turns out we can have exactly the, that kind of lower bound version of this theorem. In the lower bound version, we have something like this. This a uh, the I mean for every h is lower bounded by empirical risk. And then the same term, but put a minus there. And that's going to give us a lower bound. And that means uh, the, the risk becomes smaller, then this term will become small. So that's what we can, can get for the lower bound version. For epsilon will be the same. Plus epsilon will be, uh, so here we have a two plus, It will be the same, but then if you put uh, two minus there, that will have this probability smaller than two minus, that will have this probability. Okay. So, I mean, intuitively one, two, three, four, and the, the red versions about the lower bound say the same thing. The, I mean, we want good thing means with estimated empirical risk, we want to bound, put the upper bound on the actual risk. There's a red version, which really try to say, with based on the empirical risk, we want to put a lower bound of the uh, of the actual risk, and all, in all these cases, things are very. I mean, in both cases, things are symmetric, and then what we can prove on the upper bound case can also hold for the lower bound case. Okay. Just to sum up, we studied about uh, I mean number one. They often perhaps so number two, but they can be phrased in terms of epsilon. And then the term that you will see often is this term, which is exponentiation of minus two m epsilon square. And then all, all these results can be phrased in terms of, uh, yeah, all these things can be phrased in terms of a, a lower bound version. Okay. Okay, so given this preparation, let's do the analysis. So for structural risk minimization, so then the key, the I said there is just the general, I mean, upper bound on the. Uh, on the risk of what we can compute using structural risk minimization. I mean, to compute in an idealized sense. And then, but before talking about this, I said, actually the, the term that structural risk minimization optimized is in alpha k. K of H, which is the recurrent risk plus Adamaka complexity of HK plus so I said this actually comes from the generalization bound. So that's what we're gonna prove first. So what we are going to show, we show the following probability. This lemma is embedded inside the proof of uh, theorem 4.2 in the textbook, but I took it out. So the lemma says, when you're learning problem, so any things that we really want to learn, and any number of examples in the sample, and then for any required precision that we, the probability that for H4K, 
So this really means uniformly, we can, I mean, we can bound the risk of H with high probability. So with high probability, we're going to do this. Now, let me tell you, I mean, so if you saw a formula like this, uh, I think this just looks so complicated. But uh, I think if somebody become an expert in this kind of domain, they just look at this formula and understand what's really going on. What's really going on here is that we want to have a uniform bound, which works for all K and for all H at the same time. So then, I mean, what are the typical proof strategy? Proof strategy is to use a, a union bound and to do the union bound, we need we will take a sum over all the possible entries. So sum over all the possible entries in K. And these two things, the number two and the, this extra term, that take care of the using union bound with respect to K. And then the, the other stuff. So the other step, which is the I mean, Radamaka complexity and the, this delta here, and they are there to take care of this universal quantum, uniform bound for, for all the possible k. So we're going to use Radamaka complexity bound during the proof to take care of this uniform bound over all h. But we will do apply another uh, union bound to take care of this outer quantification over K. Okay, so that's, so just to sum up, the, by looking at these things, I mean, you will see that the proof is essentially application of two union bounds. The one outer union bound will be, will take care of this universal quantification of K that will introduce this uh, square root of global K divided by M. And then two, um, these two factor in the uh, in the last, that it involves something related to this delta. Yeah. So here, so that's what's going to happen. And uh, for the in inside uniform bound, we're going to use Radamaka complexity bound. Okay, let's see how the proof works. Often, when you do the proof for the universally quantified version, it's much easier to do the proof for the existentially quantified version because the then application of a union bound becomes much more explicit. So that's what we're gonna use here. So we'll prove. Okay. So there exists some K and some hypothesis which violates this upper bound property with a low probability. Yes all this stuff. Uh, so this is what we have to prove. Okay. So how to how to do this? And okay. okay. So then here's what we do. So we first use a union bound over k because k is an integer. So we can there are possibility which is k is equal to one up to infinity. And so this is bounded by, so this is what we want to prove, okay. So this is true or not, that's what we want to prove. And so we start with, this left-hand side probability we first bound it using, using apply the union bound. It gives this. Okay. 
page. Plus by the mother complexity of the condition K. Square root of no K by I N two over delta I T. But then here's what we're gonna do. So we will take this as an epsilon. I said, and then just look at the form of a statement inside the, of this probability. I said there exists hypothesis in the hypothesis set, which whose risk deviates quite a lot from the empirical risk plus Radamaka complexity plus epsilon. That's exactly the statement that we see before. I mean, that's a statement, it's a second statement. And uh, I said that for the second statement, the form in terms of epsilon is given like this, that this is exponentiation of minus two M epsilon square. So we're gonna apply this for, so then here's what we're gonna get. So this is a union bound. And this is rather macro complexity bound. So exponentiations of minus two m. But epsilon is remains of this complicated term, so we just put in this complicated term. Okay, and plus. Slope two over delta to n square. Okay. Now this is bounded because we have an exponentiation of minus. Okay. If we put a uh, uh, means if we replace this square term by something smaller, then the entire thing gets larger because of the minus that's put it here. So that's what we will do. It's a usual thing in computing the bound. We, I mean, we would make, we simplify the formula by introducing some gap. So in this case, we do it like this. It's n of k plus 2n over that. So we squared each term. And we forget, forgot about the, the middle, the cross terms in, in this square. And in doing so, we make it smaller, but because of the minus thing, all things become larger. And if you compute this, which is the same as k is equal to one to epsilon, infinity, exponentiation of the log of one of k. So this m part gets canceled and then the, because of the minus I two k square plus and uh, there's a log of delta over two. Now if you just do the calculation of this exponentiation, what we get is the following term. k is one through infinity, one over k square plus uh, delta over two. A one over k square, the, if you add all this case, that's it's a very well known term, which is pi square divided by six. And then this, the second term doesn't depending on the k, so we, this is outcome that we can get. Now pi square is smaller than 10, so it's 10 divided by six is smaller than two. So, so we have uh, two times delta over two, so that's why we have a delta here. So, so this gives us a proof of this theorem. Uh, one, one thing in the proof you can see, really we are using this fact, this is a k square. And then if you look at where this two comes from, two comes from to cancel, it is the infinite sum over one over k square. So the two that appears here is it, together with I mean, this extra term, they cancel each other. The first extra terms here, I mean, this gives us, eventually gives us, leads to pi squared divided by six. 
to see at the bottom, and which is smaller than two. And then this uh, two factor in the second that's used to cancel that, that one. Okay. So that's the bound that we get. And now using this bound, then we can prove the, the we provide a guarantee of the structural risk minimization. So that's what we'll do next. So here's the theorem that we will do. So theorem say the same thing for all problem. For number of samples and uh, delta probability of the risk, the, the quantity that we really care about of the outcome SRN. So with a high probability, the risk of SRN, the outcome of SR, the risk of outcome of this is structural risk minimization is pretty good. It's going to be bounded above by the best we can achieve in across every hypothesis set. With some complexity measure of the hypothesis set. Yes. The high probability. So, and then this A, I mean K, K of H here is a minimum index such that hypothesis H belong to hypothesis, the simplest hypothesis set containing the index of the simplest hypothesis set containing H. So that is K of H. And that's the statement that we want to prove. With high probability, we can have a bounds on the actual generalization error of hypothesis computed by structural risk minimization. So the question is how we can prove this. Mark this here. This. So that before showing the proof, I want to phrase. Oh, okay, actually, it's okay in this case. So let's see the proof. So I suppose let's set in the epsilon to be I mean, just to simplify notation, epsilon to be the this term. This different color. Let's yeah, just write it here. It's going to be the one. That appears and so pictures. This is going to be our epsilon. So then what we have to show. We need to show. That Yes, yeah. So NTS means we need to show the probability of our features sign minus minimum 
Mas... That's greater than epsilon with less than or equal to delta. So with low probability. So this is what we have to prove. But okay, so but then if you just look at this formula, and what there's one complication because of this implement. But it turns out, I mean, showing that this is, it is sufficient, I mean, this is implied if we can prove the following. So it suffices. Because of, I mean, if you, ah, that's right. So K of H. Yes. I mean, this is not the K of the SRM, it's a K of H. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Theo. So it suffices to show that for all H in H, essentially the same statement is true. So this is the same statement, and well, let's just write it here. So for this HSSRM, I'll just write it as a HS. So let's HS be and KS be H of K of. So I just I mean get rid of this SRM superscript SRM. So and so proving the above is the same as proving, I mean is implied by if we prove the below. H S to row. K of H and less than equal to delta. And that is because, I mean, because of the continuity of the probability. And I mean, you can prove it what, I mean, if you, are familiar with dominated conversion theorem and so on, then you can prove this using dominated conversion theorem. But if you don't know, so I feel that either you know how what to do or you don't know what to do. So I would just, I mean, I think at this stage, it's better to just take it as granted. So showing the one below for all H implies the one above, okay? So here the key is we have to prove this for all H. So how we can do this? So, so then we, we proved that this uh, new sufficient condition that follows in mean, doing calculations. So the right-hand side here, bounded by, so the key of the proof is really we, are, we, we have to use two things. We have to use generalization bound that we described before. At the same time, uh, we have to use the fact that this structural risk minimization is a solution of some optimization problem. Okay, so these two things have to appear in, in the proof. Why we have to exploit that in, in this proof. So to do so, we introduce, introduce the what's maybe is being the optimization objective of the structural risk minimization. So we didn't change anything by subtracting this and adding this. 
then we say support and is there and greater than epsilon. So this is the same as what we started with. And then if something is a, I mean, if some quantity has is greater than epsilon, that implies either this one is greater than epsilon over two, or this second one has to be greater than epsilon over two. Otherwise, if both of them are smaller than equal to epsilon over two, I mean, it won't be that there are some won't be the greater than epsilon. Okay. So there is an or. So we use a union bound, so which means that for any or, if we separate them out and then compute probability separately, that probability gets larger. So here's what we get by doing so. We have a probability of HS minus FKS just greater than epsilon two plus probability of FK HS. Yes. R of H. Not just by so R of H minus two R M of this. Periods. Supporting or greater than. So this is just coming from the union bound. So minus. And now we are using the fact that this uh, HS is an optimizer because. This HS is an optimizer. Um, so you yeah, have to use K sub square S. Yeah. It's an optimizer. So of, uh, of this qu entire quantity, if we replace this guy by F of K of H and H, this entire things, the, the terms that I mean, this entire term this is going to become larger because I mean, we are replacing minimizer by non-minimizing thing. So this whole thing will become larger. So if you do so, and then do some calculations, which means this, uh, right. so I mean, this term, will contain, so it's a empirical risk plus Radamaka complexity, so which we can cancel by using one of this, plus square root of I mean, the log of k of h divided by m. So between among these two, one of one of the two can be can can be used to cancel something that appears here. If we do this calculation, here's what we can get. So the, Left hand side will be the same, but then the right hand side will be empirical risk of H minus risk of H minus uh, Radamacher complexity of H and uh, square root of over k of h minus n. So I mean greater than epsilon over two. So let me rewrite this. I mean, although it doesn't I mean by moving things around a little bit, so we can 
Let me select. Can't select all of this. Okay. Sorry about this. It's, I don't think I am. Can I just write it here? Okay. Okay. Right. Minus. So the probability, say, exactly in the one that I just showed you. So we just move R of H to the other side, epsilon to, to the upper side. Now, if we do so, then these things will become the form that I, of, of the previous lemma, the first things say, right, the first things is, is you know, about for, for this one, I mean, this one is exactly of the, the property that we showed. So this part, so here, This part was uh, f of k, h, and h. So the probability that the risk is bounded above by f of k of uh, this this term plus is a I mean the square root of I mean this, this term is going to be one over delta, and the opposite case the r of h is greater than I mean, this plus I mean, the term here is going to be bounded above by delta. So that's exactly this scenario. We are thinking about probability of a risk of a R H of S is goes above this F term plus epsilon over two. Okay. So just like, I mean, the several slides before I said, this delta version can be rephrased in terms of the epsilon version. So if we rewrite things in terms of epsilon version, this first term by the one that we proved is bounded above by this two exponentiation minus two m to square. So it's very similar to the one before. So we said, minus 2m epsilon square, because we have epsilon over two. So that's why we have the epsilon over two square here. And this number two came because our bounds involve two over delta instead of one over delta. Okay. Then the other term is also very similar. So the other term talk about, uh, the other term talk about when the, risk of age is really small compared to the empirical risk, okay? Empirical risk, and these extra terms are Radamacher complexity, something involved the square root of log of k and then epsilon. And that's very much like the term that appears in the definition of f, definition of f, except that we are using minus instead of plus. I said, although we only prove something for the plus version and the upper bound version, Something for the lower bound version also holds by essentially the same arguments. 
And then this one is also phrased in terms of the epsilon over two. So exactly the same bound will apply here. So, so we get here to exponentiation of minus two m two square. So if we add all of them together, it's a four exponentiation minus two sin square. Maybe. And epsilon square over two. So for epsilon, it was in this term. It was this. So if you square them and plug in this epsilon, then I mean this becomes exactly the same as delta. So that's that completes the proof. So in the proof, I mean the in a sense the only kind of creative part is to I mean is to use this continuity of the probability to replace a bound in of, of I mean in terms of infimum, I mean bound expressed in, term, in terms of infimum uh, to a bound uh, with, for, that holds for all H. And then we use the, the generalization bound that we showed in the in the previous slide. And, and also it's a dual version. Okay, so, so this is, that's the bound for this uh, structural risk minimization. Now, are we done? And so then now let's go back to this algorithm. Number two, three. risk minimization is an algorithm. So we may ask, is it good enough? And then it turns out this algorithm has a multiple problems. I mean, or when we try to derive an algorithm from structure risk minimization, we encounter multiple problems. What's the first problem? The first problem is it poses a computational challenge. So the first computational challenge is that uh, it's rather macro complex, as I said. It's not really computable. And then the second problem is this, although we didn't say very much, so minimizing this, is it? it's not easy. So in terms of computational complexity, so this, this mean, mean often this function, I mean, this is defined by the average, I mean, average error, so one over n, some, and, and so on. And then this of minimizing this function, it doesn't really, this function doesn't really have any nice structure. And then, so minimizing this often becomes an empty hot. And uh, so to doing so is not going, is not easy. The second problem is uh, constraints in the structure. Of it. So you just said there are this family age has to be countable. And sometimes this constraints is, is not very easy. I mean, it's very constraining. So if you may want to have uh, some impose a structure on this H, which have a much richer structure, and then this structure risk minimization has a very discrete flavor, and then doesn't really allow us to have a family that is uncountable. So we're gonna look at cross validation. 
and enfold cross validation. That is, in some sense, address the may address the first issue. Validation and enfolds cross validation. And actually, the other things that we're gonna look at. So somehow, I mean, it is is related to the cross validation and enfold cross validations. But uh, they I mean this in particular cross validation and both cross validation will address the first issue. For the these the two other issues, we will look at something uh, called convex surrogate objective. So we will consider some different objective, not this uh, empirical risk, which is closely related to the empirical risk, but it's much easier to optimize because it defines a complex function. And for this uncountable issue, we will look at, we'll see how we can rephrase some idea like this model selection in terms of regularization. So if you phrase things in terms of regularization, in a sense, we are really thinking about uncountably many uh, models, which uh, splits this uh, our the, our set of this unit the entire set of model, and then we are searching for the appropriate models via this so-called regular optimizing via regularization. So that's what we're gonna do. So in the remaining five minutes, I'm gonna tell you about the idea of cross validation. And then the M for the cross validation. So, so what's the idea of cross validation? I think this is cool. So cross validation and enfold cross validation. I think they, if you're again familiar with machine learning, I mean you used it in a many different contexts. But here we are thinking about this cross validation from the perspective of model selection. Okay. I mean hyperparameter tuning, yeah, that's also part of model selection. But we are thinking more in terms of the kind of model selection we have been talking about so far. So What's the idea of cross validation? The idea of the cross validation is we want to, I mean, we want to measure, so we want to separate out optimization involved in finding. Empirical risk minimization solutions. And uh, evaluations of good solutions. So in other words, so they I mean the idea of structural risk minimization is, I mean, although it's not, I mean, the real incarnation of the, the, the algorithm derived from SRM does a bit something more clever. Structure risk minimization is if you have a hypothesis set like H1, H2, H3, so on. For each of this, we compute ERM solution, H of ERM. Uh, no, not SRM. So, so this is not really a description of SRM. This is more about cross validation. So the idea of cross validations works like this. For every H, we compute ERM. And so on. 
And then we have a separate phase. So we use a sample S to do this, but, but we have a reserve separate independent samples to evaluate how well they are doing. So we evaluate this with respect to S prime, uh, compute empirical risk with respect to S prime. So, and then based on this evaluation, it picks the one that shows the highest performance. If, for instance, the one that shows the highest performance is prep. If the showing highest performance is the third one, then that's going to be the outcome here. So, so that this is separate phase, I mean, the, the, in some sense, in doing so, we indirectly, I mean, that these extra terms in the Radamati, when in the structure risk minimization, are there to account for the estimation error. So how hard it is to find an optimal solution in each hypothesis set. And then we, by separating out the optimization phase using one sample, evaluation phase with the different samples, we, in a sense, account for this, uh, this aspects of the uh, estimation error in the, which is handled by the extra terms, the Radamaka complexity and some square root terms for in the in the SRM case. Okay. So that's a cross validation and the algorithm description is like this. So it has a hyperparameter alpha, which is a number between zero and one. So then it's an algorithm. So take a hyperparameter and then the input is a sample. But then the first step is it splits input S to two parts. So a sample of size M, S1 and S2, such that the size of S1 is one minus alpha M size of S2 is just alpha n. Then what it does is that it solves the following optimization problem, which just pick K star, which is the minimum. Yeah, it's a minimum of the H ERM. So, ERM obtained from a uh, hypothesis at K using sample S1, but when you compute this argmin, optimization objective is computed with respect to S2, empirical risk of S2. So the important bit here is we are using S2 here, then we are using S1 for the training, S2 for the testing. Then we for well, once K star is picked up, this algorithm return H E R N S one and K star. So that's the algorithm. In, at least that appears in the textbook, and we're gonna analyze this algorithm. So before finishing, let me mention one more thing. So the this algorithm is, at least the, the descriptions in the textbook is a bit different from the, what's going to happen in the M-fold cross-validation that we're going to look at next. So there's a difference between this and the N-fold uh, cross-validation. One of the differences, I mean, instead of in the final outcome that we're going to return, it will be I mean, there are multiple differences. Final outcome that we return is going to be like this ERM trained over not S1, but S1. I'm going to write this notation to emphasize this. Okay, stop. 
And then picking K star is also slightly different. Okay. So, so the, the reason I mentioned this is because, I mean, this splitting idea, this is sometimes called validation set, can be used in a way in the cross validation sense, but it can also be used in a different way. So, and both cross validation focus more on the generalization ability of, an, of each hypothesis set. It measures, so it's a bit hierarchical. You pick a hypothesis set, which generalize well, and then but it, then it uses that specific hypothesis set. Okay. Sorry about going over time. I mean, that's it for today. And when I talk about it, this cross validation and import cross validation next week. Okay, so thank you very much.